Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here and you enjoy listening to horror stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below. You won't regret it. Also, please leave a like before we get started. Thank you. Being home alone was something that I was totally accustomed to. I'd lived alone for the past two years since my roommate suffered a fall and ended up passing away from breaking her neck. It wasn't something that we saw coming, and to be honest, I didn't understand why it had to happen to her. Eva of all people was the girl that had a difficult life. Her dad had passed away when she was eight, and her mum was taken into prison. As a result, Eva was put up for adoption, and when she finally hit 18, she left that and never returned. She used to tell me stories about how it was, and these are stories that I wouldn't even want to tell you guys here tonight. Once she passed away, for a long time, I was in disbelief. Most evenings I would just sit in silence as I watched the TV, the images in front of me flickering, but nothing was being activated in my mind. I felt empty, completely blank inside. Being alone was something I eventually got used to. I've never been much of a social freak. I was never someone who would always go partying clubbing, or adventuring with huge groups of people. My parents had volunteered me to go into scouts when I was younger, but I'll be honest, I hated it, and anything to do with summer camp I despised. Being with Ava was the only thing I really wanted to do. Other than Ava, I had three other friends. They were my cousins. So, in reality, when I was in my house alone, I didn't really give a shit. 19. Female For those of you that are wondering, I really don't care about my life. I guess you could say this isn't important in this story, but it might add a bit of context as to what happens next, and why. Most of my family couldn't understand my reaction, and neither could I really. I think naturally, I should have probably fought the man off, but in the moment, I was so sad, I was so deep in thought, and still depressed with Eva's passing, that I couldn't really think properly, if that makes sense. It was 2011. I was living in my own house with Eva, and she had randomly passed away after falling down the stairs and suffering an accident. I remember seeing her in the hospital and life support. It made me tear up. I hadn't cried in years. I felt bad for her more than anything else. When she looked at me with her eyes, I could see her in there, but it was like something was holding her back. It was like her hair, her eyes, and her skin was no longer her, but the eyes? They were trapped. They were her soul, trapped in a body that no longer worked. The life support became vital. Eventually, she fell deep into a coma. A huge infection spread throughout her spine. Somehow, her immune system couldn't fight it. And after doses upon doses of medication, they turned the machines off. Eva only had a couple of grandparents left. Her mother was still in prison, and her father had passed away when she was eight. I was there for her though, and that's all that matters, because in my mind, I don't really care about the rest of her family letting her down. The most important thing is that I was there for her. After her passing in 2011, I focused on my uni work and tried my best to keep my head down. Life became very dark, it became a depressive place, 
so I didn't really care about all the issues that were thrown my way. Whenever something bad happened to me, I would simply just remember Eva and how she looked in that hospital bed on the last days of her life. That would give me context. That would give me understanding. And that would give me appreciation of the moment. It was a Friday evening. I was going to spend it like any other Friday evening since Eva's passing. Sat in front of my TV, watching another stupid series that I probably wouldn't even pay attention to. Most of the time, I'd fall asleep while the TV was on. Then I'd either wake up when the commercials come blaring on, or I'd just wake up in the morning and sleep through all the commercials. When I did that, I knew I was very depressed, and most likely a bit of sleep deprivation added in. When I got home from my work, I realized that I had to study a bit in the evening. I had an assignment coming up, and I'd only written 10,000 of the 15,000 words due. We'd been given half a year to do it, so it wasn't too bad. But as usual, I'd left everything to the last minute. I got back and popped the kettle on. I started boiling some water to make myself a hot coffee. I needed something that could give me a hit wake me up out of my slumber. As the kettle pinged, I grabbed the mug. I grabbed a few tablespoons of coffee. Yes, you read that right. Tablespoons. I like my coffee strong. I don't know about you, but when it kicks me, I feel awake, alive, and ready to work. As I started sipping on the warm coffee, it took a few minutes to kick in. When it did, I went straight up to my desk in my bedroom and started working. By this point, it was around about 6pm in the evening. It was starting to get dark out and I couldn't really see many meters past the outside window. I'd been working for a couple hours. I looked up at the clock and my eyes were so blurry from all the work that I could barely see properly. I dropped my pen and raised both my hands to rub my eyelids as hard as I possibly could. Once I had done this, my eyes started to adapt again. The clock started to unblur itself, and it read 8pm, or thereabouts. It was time to take another break. I'd managed to get myself up to 13,000 words, but my goal was 15,000, or maybe a little bit more, just to please my professor. I ran downstairs to make myself some pasta. I had some leftover marinated chicken breasts in the fridge from a couple of days ago. It was wrapped up in kitchen foil, so I got it out and started unwrapping it. I placed it in the microwave to zap it. I put it in for around 5 or 10 minutes, then boiled up some pasta, cut up some onions and peppers, and got them frying in some olive oil. Once the food was cooked up, I'd been downstairs for another 20 or so minutes. I might have slightly burnt the onions setting off the fire detector, but that's nothing to do with this story, just an embarrassing moment that I probably didn't need to mention. I took my food back upstairs and started eating. Once I got done eating, I don't know if it was the olive oil or the chicken, but I felt so sluggish that I could barely keep my eyes open any longer. I decided it was best to go and lie on the bed, but as I was about to lie on the bed, my sister ended up ringing me. I picked up the phone. It was her fortnightly check-in to see if I was doing okay. They knew at Eva's funeral that I had been affected really badly by her passing. I was the one who found her in the state she was in, and I was the one who had to wait 45 minutes for the fucking ambulance to arrive. Yeah, I won't go there, because I can go on a rant for hours about that, and I know it has nothing to do with the medics, so I have nothing but gratefulness for them. I talked with my sister for a couple of minutes. She asked me to go downstairs because she wanted to know if I had a pair of shoes that she used to wear. She had been round mine a couple of weeks ago, 
and it turns out she had left a pair of her hiking boots. They were full of mud and stunk like horse crap, so I decided to put them outside the door, by the doorstep. While I was down there, I sat down and turned the TV on after she hung up the call. While I was watching TV, I felt myself drifting in and out of consciousness. I tried my hardest to stay awake, knowing that I still had 2,000 words to write upstairs for my assignment. There was only a week left until the deadline, but before I knew it, I was looking at darkness. There I was fast asleep and it must have been around 9pm. The next thing I know, I'm waking up to the sound of my front door opening. Naturally, I just think, oh, it's Eva. Even though it had been ages since her passing, I still had that muscle memory, and I still actually thought it was her walking through the door. In those seconds that I heard the door opening and closing, I didn't feel any source of fear, desperation or panic because in the moment there was nothing to be scared of if it was either but it wasn't i stood up and then i finally calculated the fact that eva was no longer alive that's when i realized before i turned my head i had a mini heart attack my chest tightened and i could barely breathe properly i turned my head and there is a man, six foot tall, standing there, with a black jacket, red underwear, and a pair of boots. I don't know what the hell he's doing, I don't know who he is. One part of me wants to burst out laughing, while the other part wants to run away scared. The guy looked like he was part of a prank, but I didn't know what to think of it. So I immediately just walked away, trying to put distance between myself and him. The man was wearing red underwear, a pair of boots, and socks that went up to his knees. He looked like the local homeless crackhead, except he didn't. He was in his twenties, he looked youngish, around my age, and there he was, now following me up the stairs, as I walked up them, backwards to keep an eye on him. The man was breathing pretty heavy, and as I started backing up the stairs, he started to make these really weird sadistic noises. As he was breathing heavy, he was moaning with every exhale. It was starting to make me feel genuinely terrified for my life. With that, I turned around and started sprinting as fast as I could up the stairs. When I got into the bathroom, I slammed the door shut. Just in time, I managed to twist the lock on the door. The man outside was turning the handle, trying to barge his way in to get to me. I'd locked the door just before he managed to pull the handle down. And, somehow, I managed to have my phone on me the whole time. It was still in my pocket, and I prayed to God that night for thanking him. That phone was in my pocket and it meant that I could call 911. I put the call on loudspeaker so the guy could hear everything. He was trying to kick his way through to the bathroom, but the second the dispatch answered, he immediately stopped kicking. The banging noises went away, and the maniacal moaning and breathing stopped. I couldn't really hear what he was saying, as I didn't get chance to listen out. This was because the dispatcher was so loud, she kept on asking me millions of questions. How old are you? What do you look like? Where do you live? Is there anyone in the house with you? Do you know this man? What does he look like? Is he armed? Where? You couldn't stop these questions if you asked them to. It was so difficult, but I had to answer every single one of them. I'd been answering questions for at least 15 minutes, when finally, a unit of police turned up outside. I could hear the sirens off into the distance, and then eventually, knocking at my door. They must have walked straight in, as the guy who left, clearly left the door wide open. Up here, up here, hello, 
I started screaming while I was crying, leaning on the bathroom handle. They knocked on my door. Please, please. I unlocked the door and opened it to find three police officers stood there. In those moments, I wanted to run and hug them. I didn't know who they were, but I felt safe in their hands. The man that had come into my property was a drunk guy. He was also found to be high on drugs, and he was walking around the lane a mile away when the police finally found him. I don't know why this story is so stupid, so scary, and yet so comical at the same time. I think if Eva was there, she would have most likely beaten the crap out of this guy. She took no nonsense, especially from males. So, I hope you're watching Eva. I hope you're proud of what I did. I tried my best, and if the guy had got hold of me, I'd probably be with you, up in the clouds, or even more depressed, recovering from some grade A level trauma after he finished with me. My grandpa with dementia scared the living fuck out of me. Hey, my name's Annie, and at the time, I was 31 years old. My grandpa is in his late 80s. He'd been suffering from dementia since he was 70. I'd been caring for him for a while, but he was adamant to keep his own house and his dogs. I didn't like getting on the wrong side of grandpa, as John was the type of guy that was very stubborn. He would always get angry and fall out with me whenever I tried to tell him that it should be a different way. Mum and Dad told me that the best thing to do was to simply just take care of him in the most uninvasive way possible. I would make him food, I would also prep him meals, putting it all in the fridge, and then I would simply leave. I would always ask John the question, is there anything else I can do for you? He would look up at me and go, no, go away. It was kind of bad. Towards the end, I felt like there was this disconnect between myself and him. When I went back to my place, it was around about a two minute walk down the road, so I never used to drive unless it was absolute bucketing it down. When I got back to my apartment, I unlocked it and decided that I was going to go into chill and then grab a shower. Later that night, after I'd grabbed my shower, I got changed into my nightclothes and went to sleep. It wasn't much of an evening. I never really had any big things to do, as I worked part-time. My job was all done in the office. I never, ever did any work at home, and I swore to keep it that way. One day, my manager even rang up, asking me if I could take some spreadsheets home and do them on my laptop. I quoted some weird law about workplace, and I said no, in a legal and literate type of way. I never heard back from him, and I think he gave the work to someone else, Andy probably. After my night had been done, I felt good after having a shower. I made my way to bed and turned all the lights off and made sure everything was locked up. I had never been paranoid of anyone breaking in, and the only people with keys to my apartment were, one, my mum and dad, and two, the spare key kept at Grandpa John's down the road. While I was sleeping, I heard a noise. It was a faint noise, so initially, I thought it was part of my dream. I usually tend to have very clear dreams, and sometimes, maybe once or twice a month, I can lucid dream. In the dream I was having, I was on holiday in Italy with my mum. 
I was in a room, I couldn't tell where, I'm assuming it was some type of a hotel. In the dream I was stood up in the centre of the room while my mum was holding open the door out into the corridor. I thought that the knocking noises were coming from her hand against the door. However, as the noises got louder and louder, I eventually awoke from my sleep. It took a lot to wake me up, as in my dream, it felt like the knocking had been going on for at least minutes. When I came round, I opened my eyes slightly. I couldn't really see very much. I readjusted my position in the bed, turning over to the other side. I always felt more comfortable sleeping on my left. I don't know why, it just felt more comforting. Then, once I had readjusted my position of how I was sleeping, I shut my eyes again, putting the noises down to simply being in the dream and then waking me up. I've been trying to get back to sleep for a few seconds, when all of a sudden, I hear these rummaging sounds coming from another room in my apartment. The walls in my apartment are paper thin, so, if someone's in the room next door, talking, coughing, or sometimes even walking, I can hear it. This made me open my eyes and immediately sit upright in the bed. I started listening carefully, and my focus became razor sharp. Not because I was some type of an assassin, but rather because I was scared that someone was actually in my apartment. I kept listening. And sure enough, I could hear footsteps in the living room outside my door. Then, a few seconds of footsteps turned in to the lights being turned on. My heart sank to the bottom of my chest as I realised that there was someone inside of my apartment. Straight away, I didn't think, oh, is this mum or dad? No. Instead, I thought someone was actually trying to steal stuff. So, the first thing I did was grab my phone and unlock it. Once I had my dial ready, I was about to call 911 as I got closer to the door. There was no lock on my bedroom door, so, if they knew that I was in here, I was pretty much finished. As I opened the door slowly, I made the plan of trying to make the least possible noise. If these people were rummaging through my shit, trying to steal as much as they could, then I figured the quieter I am, the better. If they want my stuff, they can have it. But if they want me, then I'll have no choice but to try and defend myself. As I turned the door handle, I tried to open it as slowly as I possibly could, which made for what happened next to be even worse. You see, as I was opening the door slowly, I started to see some cloth on the other side, between the gaps and the opening in the door and the frame. The more I pulled open the door, the more cloth I saw, until eventually, I started seeing skin. Then, the skin was recognisably a chin, which then turned into a pair of lips then a nose, and before I realised it, my body had subconsciously launched itself backwards around two or three metres, causing me to bang my head on the back wall. Stood there was Grandpa John. He looked half asleep and had worn nothing but a pair of slippers and his pyjama bottoms. Somehow, he'd remembered exactly where my apartment was, even though the last time he had been here was over a year ago. I guided him into my bedroom, sat him on the end of the bed, and called my mum to come pick him up. I felt a bit shaken up. I was scared as he shook me back, and my head was pounding from where I'd banged it against the wall. Mum took around 20 minutes to get to my place, seeing as she lives a good 5 or 6 miles away. When she arrived, my granddad took a while to actually recognise her, which showed us that he had deteriorated extremely badly. We guided him into the car and drove him back to his house. 
Me and mum had a chat after that, earlier that morning, and realised that it was probably best if he comes to live with one of us. This was the start of us trying to sell his house, and the beginning of him fighting us to keep it. It was heartbreaking, and slowly, he started to forget who we even were. This is the horror story, the reality of people not remembering their loved ones, the disease that slowly eats their brain, while you feel helpless because you can't heal them. Sometimes I really think we're living in hell, but in reality, I guess you could say everyone's else perceptions are different, and that everyone gets a different card in life. The balance of the checkered boards, black and white, white representing positivity and success, black representing those of the negative energies. The balance of the universe can be something that I've considered an explanation for why my granddad became the way he did. He was lucky to make it into his late 80s. He lived a long life and he had a lot of loved ones throughout those 88 years. But that night, I'll never forget, launching myself back, not even realising that my body had reacted before it actually had. I had a lump on the back of my head for a good couple of weeks after that, a swollen bruise that hurt like shit. I used an ice pack on it 20 times a day, but it took ages to go down. So long that I actually went to get it checked out at the local accident and emergency. Grandad, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I wish I could help, but I can't. I don't know who came up with the ridiculous idea to put pepper in yoghurt and give it a luxurious flavour name, but I believe that person must have been very heartbroken when they came up with the idea. Pepper yoghurt tastes good whenever you're in a solitary mood and don't really want to deal with anyone or anything. That was exactly what it was made for to maintain your depressed state, but not let you dive too deep into it either. My tongue burnt with every sip of the cold glass in front of me, and I felt like throwing away the entire thing, but I just couldn't. I needed it for the crappy way I felt right now. I thought this weekend was going to be a great one, and looked forward to spending time with my boyfriend of two years only to get dumped by text as I drove home. My brain didn't know how to process the breakup messages that on display on my screen as I made my way back home. I couldn't get out and scream because I was on the road and I couldn't let myself get too emotional because I was the one driving. I felt like crap inside and wanted nothing more than to scream my lungs out and then fold myself under a blanket. But I couldn't because I was still on the road. My chest felt heavy as I continued driving towards my apartment. The air felt thick and suffocating around me. My head was pounding and my eyes were getting heavier by the second. I finally reached my apartment building and unlocked the door. I literally had to drag myself to the kitchen as my mind tried to process the surge of pain and all the other emotions that were slowly taking over my entire body. I opened the fridge and poured myself a glass of the odd flavoured yoghurt, I was saving it to taste it with my now ex-boyfriend. A soothing yet overly spicy taste swirled around my mouth and a teardrop rolled down my cheek. 
Something about the yogurt forced out all the emotions I was feeling and forced me to deal with them. I shut the fridge door and took the whole thing with me to the living room. I slowly slipped into the soft cushions of my couch, my body sinking into the plushness as if trying to disappear into its depths. The strange drink sat in front of me, its contents still mainly untouched, as tears continued to roll down my cheeks. Every sip I had taken earlier had been a bittersweet mixture of pain, yet numbing comfort. My whole being was tired, drained of any energy to even make a sound. I just sat there with my eyes fixed on the blank TV screen, as I continued to sip out of the glass in front of me. Time seemed to blur as I lost myself in my thoughts, my mind a whirlwind of emotions. The room around me was enveloped in a heavy silence, the only sound being the faint hum of the refrigerator in the distance. The darkness outside matched the darkness within me, the world seemingly holding its breath waiting for the storm of my heartache to pass. My eyelids grew heavy, and before I knew it, I had succumbed to exhaustion and had fell asleep right there on the couch. I awoke at midnight, and my face felt raw, etched with cracks and patches from where my tears had once stained my makeup. The room was cloaked in darkness, the moon casting a faint glow through the window, illuminating the outlines of my apartment. A pang of hunger twisted my stomach, reminding me of the neglect my body had endured. The pain was from the nonsensical concoction I consumed earlier, causing my insides to churn uncontrollably. I gathered the glass I had used, its surface wet with tear stains, and made my way to the kitchen. The light from the refrigerator spilled across the linoleum floor as I opened it, the cold air caressing my face. I rinsed off the glass, washing away the remnants of my sorrow with the liquids in it. After this, I carefully returned the pepper yogurt to the bottom shelf. It seemed ironic now that this peculiar beverage had become the symbol of my melancholy a reminder of my shattered relationship. My attention turned to the leftover pizza that sat on the counter, a lingering reminder of the shared moments with my ex-boyfriend. I placed it inside the microwave and set the timer. As the microwave buzzed, the pizza began to rotate in circles, a hypnotic dance that mirrored the cycles of my two years' relationship. Watching the pizza spin, I found myself reflecting on the countless compromises and sacrifices I made in the name of love. The image of my ex-boyfriend's face flickered in my mind, his words echoing in the emptiness of my heart. How many times had I ignored my own needs, disregarded my own happiness, just to keep the fragile threads of our relationship intact? The microwave beeped, and I pulled the pizza out of it. I put a slice of it and made my own way back to the living room. I finally stripped out my work clothes before grabbing and biting into the pizza slice in my hand. I got back up to get a drink, when all of a sudden I heard a ruffle and the flowers outside my apartment. Most evenings I would always keep at least one window open, even if it is just slightly, as I have OCD and I'm pretty obsessed with having fresh air in the house at all times. I thought maybe it was a fox or a raccoon, so I just ignored it and continued walking to the kitchen. I grabbed a can of soda and made my way back to the living room, when the living room door suddenly began opening. Fear gripped me and I hurried to shut the door, but I was too late. A lanky looking man, with a ski mask covering most of his face, walked through the doorway of my apartment. I didn't know if he already saw me, but I instinctively ducked down to avoid meeting his gaze. 
he slowly walked upstairs to my living room, and I could hear ruffles as he started going through all my stuff. I didn't know what to do in this situation, so I ran to the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and tiptoed upstairs. My plan was to lock myself in the bathroom, as I genuinely didn't know what to do at this point. As I was walking up the stairs, I knew that it was highly likely I'd probably encounter this guy. In my mind, I'd had such a shit day that I didn't really care what happened. I was ready for a fight. If you call it delusional, then so be it. I kept walking up the stairs slowly, trying to listen out with my awful hearing. My knife was clutched in my right hand, while my left hand was out in front of me, ready to push the guy back to get a clean blow. I made my way to the top of the steps. I was now stood a foot of the landing. I could hear the man going through all the drawers in my bedroom. This was the time that I now used the opportunity to run past my bedroom door, run into the bathroom, and slam the door shut behind myself. Once I started running, I heard the sounds of ruffling and clustering completely stop. I knew he could hear me, but I didn't know if I had enough time to make it to the bathroom before he could come out my bedroom and grab me. I managed to make it, but almost dropped the knife in the process. The man stopped making all the noises, and at this point I was expecting him to come barging out of the door, but he didn't. In fact, he didn't even try the bathroom handle. I locked the door, curled up in the corner and held my knife in the direction of the door. I waited, and waited, and waited. The bathroom door is pretty thick, and the walls of my apartment are made of brick, not plaster, so I couldn't hear a thing that was going on in my bedroom. I couldn't even tell if the guy was still in the apartment, or if he had already left. As I curled up into a ball in the corner of the bathroom, I thought to myself how shit the whole day had been. This really was about to top things off. I called the cops as I had my mobile on me, and I held the knife tightly still in my right hand. The dispatcher answered and I accidentally had it on speakerphone. I quickly turned her back to plane mode and held the phone up against my ear. I explained briefly what happened, telling them that there's a man in my house. The dispatcher told me to get to safety, in which I replied I am. I'm hiding in my bathroom and the door's locked. Halfway through the phone call, all of a sudden I hear a loud creaking noise outside of the bathroom door. It sounds like the floorboards moving, as they were attached to the same room as the landing and the bathroom. The second I hear the noise, I freeze. I mute the call between the dispatcher and just listen, in pure agony. At this point I was praying, hoping that no one would try and kick down the door and kill me. I was depressed though, as you knew how my whole evening went. It set me up for failure in this situation, yet somehow I somehow managed to survive. The noise is stopped, and the man leaves my property. I don't know if he could hear me on the phone to the operator, but perhaps it put him off. When the cops turned up, they got me out of the bathroom. They then took me round every room in my apartment, asking me to do a visual inventory or some kind of memory bank. This allowed me to tell them what I thought had been stolen, or what I could remember I used to have, which was no longer in the room. As I went round with one of the sergeants and his notepad, it was genuinely shocking how much stuff this guy had taken. TVs, jewellery, even things like a pillow. I have no idea why he took my pillow, but he did. So, from this point onwards, I lock every door in my house, and I have this safety feature fitted on all the windows. As you guys know, because of my OCD, I still have to have them open but now I feel a whole lot more secure. This is still the most unlucky day of my life, and I sure do hope that in the future, it doesn't get topped.
Matt, how could you? The words from my mum as I stared into her face. She had sadness in her eyes, and I knew I was fucked. This is not what a child does. Why would you do that? She ran a hand through my hair and sighed before meeting her gaze again. This time with a look of regret and guilt. I felt sick, but the lump in my throat made it hard to speak. I... I don't know. I'm sorry. I tried to apologize. My voice cracked and the lump returned. I tried to keep the tears out of my face but couldn't. It wouldn't stop coming. Tears just kept streaming down my face. Even after a long pause, I didn't know how long I would be able to cry until I choked up completely. It felt like hours, maybe minutes, that I stayed silent. Eventually my dad walked in. Apparently he had heard the news. My dad wasn't someone who raised his voice around any of us, but I could see how livid he was. The veins on his forehead looked like they were going to pop out in any second. I wasn't sure he had seen me yet. Where the hell is he? Dad called out as he laid eyes on me. Dad, I can explain. I'll do the talking young man, so keep quiet. Don't make me raise my voice. I nodded and sat back down. I waited for a while. But dad never said anything. He just sat there. The tension in the living room was so much that it felt like I couldn't breathe. I never made you feel less. I gave you everything you asked for that I could afford. I tried my best to make you become a good man. I just want to know why you decided to mess everything up in a single day. Earlier that day, I got back from school and there was no one at home. Dad was at the office and mum had to fix her hair for the family vacation. I was dared by my best friends to take out my dad's car. Dad owned a Jaguar E-Type 1961 vintage car. It was passed down from his father. It was a beautiful car and dad never really drove it around very often. But he was always in the garage working on it, changing the oil every now and then. My friends knew about the car and always asked me if I'd driven it before, but I said no. That day, Tommy and Marcus dared me to take the car out of the garage and drive it to the mall. I did it. I took the car and I drove to the mall without a single problem. I got stares when I stepped out of the vehicle. I smiled and joined my friends. We hung around for hours, and I decided to take the car back home before my dad arrived. But the boys wanted to go for a spin. I didn't want to let go of the keys, and I foolishly did. Tommy and Marcus ran to the car while I watched them anxiously. Marcus drove out of the parking lot into the street. I waited for what felt like an hour. I got no response from them, and they weren't back with the car. I tried calling them for another 30 minutes. Then, Tommy's mother was the one who picked up his mobile. Matthew, you bastard! Look what you did to my son! I heard over the phone. I listened to her rant for a long time before making my way to the hospital. After Tommy and Marcus left the parking lot, they fought over who got to drive back to the mall and ended up ramming into a garbage truck. They were still alive, but they were both in ICU. While I was the one outside, I was fine. Dad had the look of disappointment on his face. I couldn't bring myself to answer his questions. I wouldn't dare. I had no place to do so. I betrayed his trust and put my friends in danger, all in the name of wanting to prove myself. I hated the way it made me feel, and I began to hate myself for not being able to say no. 
A month after the incident, Tommy and Marcus were out of danger. They recovered, although they were close with losing their lives. I wasn't allowed to see them. It was hard trying to survive in school. It was hell. I couldn't stay on my own without hearing rumours that I tried to kill my best friends. I was alone, and I couldn't bring myself to tell my parents what was happening. Although Dad knew someone was up, and he tried to make me talk, but I didn't tell him anything. I wanted to ignore everything and just get high school over and done with. I didn't want this hanging over my head. I couldn't forgive myself for what happened to them. Marcus and Tommy called me and apologized, but I cried that night we spoke. I was so happy I could talk to them, and I begged them to forgive me. If I wasn't as spineless as I was, maybe none of that would have happened. The following week, Dad had planned a weekend trip with Mum and the rest of the family. As you can imagine, I wasn't invited. Not because they didn't want me to come. Everyone knew how uncomfortable it would be with the whole family there. Dad asked his house sit for, and I didn't complain. This was my own doing, but I just wanted someone I could talk to. Matt, don't do anything stupid. It's hard, I know. We're trying to get past the first one. Dad said sarcastically, as he walked out the front door with his suitcase. I don't blame him. I made him that way, and I regretted it. Mum walked up to me and wrapped me in a long embrace. I fought to hold back the tears. Once she let go, I stood by the door and watched him leave. I'd become an emotional wreck since that accident with Marcus and Tommy. Every little thing made me cry and I felt like I didn't deserve to live. The house was quiet as I stared around. I was grounded, and I had to work for my car and other things. It felt like I deserved all the punishment I got, so I took it all with good faith. Later that night, I wanted to grab a few things from the convenience store down the street. While walking back home, I noticed there was a car behind me. I waited a bit, but it ended up parking on the other side of the road. I began walking again, but I found the car closer this time. I ran, I didn't look back, I felt eyes on me as I ran as fast as my legs could carry me. I got close to an intersection, before eventually trying to cross the road. The car sped towards me full speed. I jumped out of the way in a split second and ran all the way back home. I lost everything I bought. Scared, I called 911 and told them everything that happened. While I talked over the phone, I heard a window shatter inside the house. Fear gripped me and I swallowed the lump that formed in my throat as I grabbed the baseball bat lying on our living room floor. I didn't make a sound as I walked downstairs towards the window in the kitchen. I heard footsteps, but then they stopped. I stood in the dark, waiting for the slightest sound. Nothing. I knew there was someone here with me, and whoever it was knows what I did and who I was. I got ready to swing the bat, but as I got closer to the kitchen, I was struck with fear. My breathing became laboured, but I kept on moving as much as I could. Then, I started to hear footsteps behind me. Before I could turn around, I fell, something connected with my jaw making me lose balance and pushing me to the floor. I didn't realise at this point I'd let go of the bat until eventually the light came on. I stared into the eyes of Marcus's mother. The sight of pure hatred emitted from her face. You evil little prick. You made it so that my son could never walk again. And here you are, walking around the street like nothing happened. She started laughing, but I could tell she had lost her mind completely. 
No one listens to their mother, but I'll make sure yours doesn't see you ever again. I tried to run, but she grabbed the baseball bat I had and started slamming it into my legs. She wasn't strong at all, but it did hurt. I felt humiliated as I started trying to beg for my life in front of Marcus's mum, who still was hitting me pretty pathetically with the baseball bat I tried to use to fight her off. Something within me felt awful, not only humiliated, but also pathetic. There I was, thinking this was an intruder, someone trying to steal things, or worse, kill me. Well, I guess it was the second, but it was a lady I'd known for years, and she was trying to get revenge, all for her son, who did forgive me. The pain didn't hurt from the baseball bat. Instead, as I lay there being hit by her in the legs, it was the emotional pain. That was the true pain that made me cry as I tried to get up and crawl away from her. Marcus's mum was in a mess. She was crying tears all down her cheeks and screaming at the same time. The screaming would be interrupted by her cussing me out. At one point I managed to get up onto my knees, where Marcus's mum began hitting me in the lower back and trying to hit me in the head. That was enough, it was starting to seriously hurt and we were both in a complete emotional mess. I stood up on my own two feet and started walking around the island in the kitchen. It got to a point where Marcus's mum just collapsed on the floor on all fours. She started screaming and crying, and I stood there contemplating whether to call the cops or not. I made the decision not to, and in fact tried to help her. Every time I tried to get near her, she would try and push me away. On the third attempt, she tried to pull me in and then bite me. She had completely lost the plot, but still... For some reason, I could understand how she felt. I could get it, I could sympathize with it, and after all this, I just stood there, refusing in my own mind to even call the cops. I sorried with her, I pleaded with her for to forgive me, and after all this, she got up and just walked out the door. Her car was recovered and although police tried to question me, I said nothing. I hid all the bruises on my legs, and they never saw them. I don't think Marcus's mum will ever forgive me. I haven't seen Marcus or Tommy ever again, but I wish I could. They both were my best friends, and now they're just mere memories. Not even that. More like nightmares.